Hi. Um, ah. So, um, yeah, this session is kind of part tutorial and part of a part boff session um, because um, uh, to, to kind of introduce the RISC-V vector extension uh, architecture. Um, there's been some progress on an, uh, work in supporting this in LLVM, but as far as I'm aware, there's no one a sort of made an approach towards thinking about what uh, what would need to be done to support it in GCC. Um, so because it's an architecture that's a, a vector architecture that's a bit different to other vectorizers that are, are existing, I think, um, uh, Roger's going to give a quick uh, tutorial overview um, so you can kind of get a bit of an understanding about how it works and um, how to write software for it. Um, Roger's just arrived from Barcelona, so it's a bit of a just-in-time tutorial. Um, while he's um, while he's going over that tutorial, I wondered if some things that might be um, questions to sort of think about that might might kick things off. Um, are there any similarities to, to properties of this architecture that are similar to things that are already in GCC? Um, uh, the variable vector length, which you'll talk about, how how well does that fit in or not fit in with existing types for vectors that are in GCC, and where might we um, expect responsibility to lie for some of the, the things that need to be handled, whether is it in Gimple or RTL, for example. Um, after Roger's given that tutorial, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what's been done so far in LLVM. Hopefully there's a bit of um, we can use as guidance or inspiration. Um, and during the discussion, I'm going to try and take notes and um, do a write-up of this session. So uh, maybe what we can get out of this is um, a plan for what kind of approaches we'd need to think about for starting to support this in GCC. Um, any questions right now? Okay, good. In that case, uh, I'm going to hand over to Roger for the tutorial. I'll just be a sec while I flip over to his slides. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks for the uh, <clears throat> opportunity to be here and introduce the vector ISO. We've had some attention uh, from the LLVM guys, and we were sort of um, worried that we didn't get much attention from the GCC community. So it's a pleasure to be here and, and bore you for 20 minutes with the vector extension definition and uh, hopefully you know, inspire you to <laughs> get us some code running on the platform. We are a little bit late in closing the ratification of the spec. We wanted to have it by May. That's not going to happen. So we're now working for a deadline of presenting closed uh, spec by November. Uh, and then opening up for the compiler teams, LLVM, and hopefully GCC, if uh, you know, I do a good job here, um, and get feedback from the compiler writers saying, guys, you, you really botched it with the architecture, you should change something or, or fix it or improve it or there's no freaking way we're ever going to generate code for these features, so forget it, right? And that feedback would then go into the process of cleaning up the definition and then go for final ratification, I don't know when, maybe whenever really the desire is we want to have compiler feedback. If the compiler is not capable of generating code, we might as well not put it in the ISO, right? So we really We'll have to, you know, we'll see how we get that feedback, but uh, really uh, that's our goal, right? So um, I hit this button, I hope. Page down. Page down. Okay. So um, uh, it's weird because this intro was for hardware guys. I'm a hardware guy. Be gentle with me. Uh, maybe you find it a little bit offensive for how simple it is. So apologies if it's offensive, <laughs> no intention. Uh, we'll go, you know, it, it really presents the whole architecture. So, you know, why, why vector extensions? I, I hope everyone agrees, but I'll go super fast. You know, uh, it gives you energy per instruction fundamentally. So you have an instruction that does lots of works, whether you come from the SIMD world or you're old enough to remember a Cray or a convex machine. Once you have one vector instruction and you say, I want to do a vector add, Fundamentally, that instruction contains lots of work to be done. If your vector is long, 
maybe the instruction says I want to do actually eight ads or 16 or 32. And your scalar core, which is sitting next to that vector unit, and the vector unit, you have many implementation choices. The scalar core uh, actually fetches one instruction, so it costs you the energy to read the iCache, energy to decode the instruction, but then, then with that, you fire lots of words. And that's where the energy savings come from. If you are a high performance person or a high performance company, high performance implementation, you can also extract a lot of performance because this one instruction says, I want to do 32 ads. So you can choose to say, you know what, I'm going to do them eight at, at a time. So eight ads at a time, that's a lot of performance at once. So, you know, vector ISIS actually give you those, those two things. Um, Let's get to the, uh, to the meat of the thing. So what will the ISA be? You've, if you've expo been exposed to RISC-5, it has 32 integer registers called X0 through X31, 32 floating point registers F0 through F31, and the vector extensions adds a uh, number of uh, variable registers, actually 32 vector registers V0 through V31. And that's probably the, pl the place where I think where I'm hoping to get lots of questions, because that's where um, the architecture is a little bit more, let's say, advanced or exotic than classic SIMD or AVX2 or SVE, in that you can do a bunch of things. First, uh, the things inside a, a vector register can be either a vector, that's what you would all expect, it's called a vector register. They can also be a matrix, that part of the spec is not done yet, we'll do it as an extension or they can hold a scalar. And that's a decision that was you know, um, long debated, but we decided that a, a V5 can act as a scalar value. Now, if you're a hardware guy like me, the moment you say that, you think, wait a minute, V5 has got all these bits, and it's just only going to hold one value? Yes, that's what it will do, because that way we have the capability of doing vector times scalar, which is a fundamental programming or language need that needs to be supported. Um, we uh, had a type system uh, for polymorphic encoding. We got a lot of feedback that people, uh, hardware companies, felt that was a little bit too complicated to build. And so we moved that to an option. So I'll, I'll, I'll not go there now. Um, and I think that what's interesting is that the uh, number of registers and the maximum length of one vector register, both are variable. Right? And, and we'll get to that in a second. And I think that's where most of the complexity could be. Um, for the rest, uh, well, the, the data elements supported are 8-bit, 16, 32, and 64. You'll see the ISAF, fairly standard, no, no surprises. And um, like classic uh, vector architectures, there is a new register introduced called VL, which is a real register that controls the operation of all the other vector instructions. So, if you have a vector that contains 32 elements, but you set VL to five, you only operate on the first five elements of your vector, right? There's also a vector mask facility, a, a way of making all vector instructions work under mask. So we'll get to that in a second, how that works, right? Um, and for the rest, I, I think the instructions since um, um, the, um, the RIS-5 ISA itself is fairly simple. Every instruction, if you've read the RIS-5 ISA, every instruction there has a vector equivalent. And then we've added like 10 or 12 more just to deal with how vectors operate. And, you know, would love your feedback on all of that. Um, the memory ordering model is very simple. Let's see if we get to that in time. And precise exceptions are supported. Um, let's move on. Otherwise, I'll eat my time as usual. Okay, a picture. This is an example. So. You, uh, let's say you're a hardware company and you decide to implement the vector extension, you'll have to make two decisions. You do have to support 32 registers, uh, and you have, the first decision you'll make is what's the max VL of your, your implementation. RIS-5 sets no limit on max VL. There's no upper limit. You do whatever you want. In, in my slides, and this is a PowerPoint restriction, I use the number eight. And I always get people at the end that come out of the meeting and I hear them with the beer and say, oh yeah, the vector extension has eight elements. No, right? 
just a PowerPoint problem, right? So you can do a max VL of four, max VL of 32, max VL of 1,000. That's your company's choice or implement, implementation choice, right? Um, then the, each vector has those many elements and always holds that, those many elements, right? Then how big is each element? That's again controlled by this field in one of the registers, V element vector element maximum width, right? So you can say, at this moment, I promise you hardware, software can tell the hardware, hey, right now I only want to use 16-bit objects, right? And so, you know, reconfigure the vector unit, and I, I'm telling you I only need 16-bit objects. So you hardware, what can you offer me? And the hardware comes back and says, oh, wow, we built, you know, maybe you built eight elements, but you built eight elements of 32 bits. That's the physical hardware storage that you have there. And if someone asks for vectors with only 16 bits, you, the hardware, have the option of saying, aha, I can make the vector length twice as large, right? If that's too complicated for your first implementation, you can just say, well, so what? <laughs> Fine, I, I got eight elements. And you know the fact that you use half the, the width, I don't care. I'll still give you eight elements. Yes? Also applies to floating points. So the question was, does it apply to integer data? It applies to anything, right? So you are promising the max width is type agnostic. Kind of do like a uh, different, different kind of vector. It's just for recording. Oh, it's just for recording. So the, the hardware cannot do like 16 bits and then eight elements for integers and 16 elements for floats or just four because that's not exposed. For that, you'll need the type extension, right? The, the, the polymorphic definition. Right? So I'll stay now with the simple one and, and we'll go there. Uh, one thing that we did set out to accomplish was to avoid the uh, infamous uh, pack, unpack, and variance thereof instruction. So there are two ways to approach the problem of multi-data type in, in the same loop, right? You either uh, you expose the, your architectural bit width, you say, uh, your AVX, say, hey, I'm 512. That's it. And then you have pack, unpack from 8 to 16, 16 to 32, and shuffle, that's fine. Or the approach taken by RIS-5 is to say, all vectors at a given moment are the same size. The, the fundamental problem you have with these 512-bit things is that in terms of objects, you might have twice as many 8-bit objects as 16-bit objects in your loop. And all sort of complications come from there, uh, both for the compiler and the architecture. Actually, probably more for the compiler than the architecture. Uh, here, the goal is to uh, say, look, what are you going to do? I'm going to operate 16-bit data with 8-bit data, fine. And how many 16-bit data objects you have? 32, fine. So then what you need is 32-bit register, um, registers that contain 32-bit 16-bit objects, excuse me, that contain 32 elements of 16 bits and also registers that contain 32 elements of 8 bits. That way you can operate naturally with these two things, multiply them and do whatever you want, and it's not... There's no length mismatch, right? So that's the reason behind that, that, that definition. Um, OK, uh, then there's the famous VL register that controls all the instructions. And uh, type enabled that the uh, type extension and uh, fixed point rounding mode and saturation control. We'll, we'll, we won't get to that, but um, feel free to ask me later and, and, and and get to details. So, okay, let's just show the most basic vector instructions. So, and let's see the definition. So, vector floating point at dot s, that's a 32-bit floating point, right? Uh, v0 is the destination, v1 is the first source, v2 is the second source. So, if you're reading the pseudo c there, what it says, it says, okay, the, the um, vectors have some length, again, 8 in the example is purely a PowerPoint uh, choice, right? Um, and it says, you know, from 0 to VL, so the first VL elements, please add them in floating point 32 and put the result in the corresponding position in V0. The picture is meant to illustrate that, so you take the A and I, you add them, and you get A plus I. You take B plus G, you add them, blah, 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 so the first five guys get added in the vector. 
what happens to all the elements that are physically in the hardware and past VL? The definition asks the hardware to zero out the rest of the register. Right? So you have a completely defined value for any of your registers after this instruction. Right? Um, if you set VL to zero, uh, on a collateral effect of the definitions, you'll get the destination zero out. That might be interesting for someone. Um, and what's critical is that nothing past VL shall raise any exception. So, mm, you know, if you, whatever, load, stores, anything that's past VL shall not raise an exception. It's as if it didn't happen. Really, you, you wrote a zero into register. What, how bad can that be, right? Cannot raise any exceptions. Um, questions on the semantics, easy enough. No one offended enough to leave the room, so that's good. Okay, um, so now, this is more for hardware people, uh, which we get this question all the time. Is this vector CMD? What's the difference between CMD and vector? We really want to put that debate to rest in that if you have these five operations to do, how are you going to execute them in the hardware, right? From the compiler point of view, that it's clear what it is. Please do that job. Now, the hardware guys look at this and say, well, if I have two floating point adders, I could do them this thing in three clocks. I got to do five things. Uh, I got two floating point adders. I'll use the first clock, second clock, and then the third clock, and we'll see what happens to the fourth clock. Or, you know, you want a high performance implementation. You can, you have flo four floating point adders. You could do that in just two clocks. Or if you come from a SIMD world and you're used to SIMD, then um, you would just do, you maybe lay down uh, eight floating point adders in your hardware physically then maybe you're going to just do all of those at once, and then three of the adders are just going to produce a zero, or you're going to mux a zero. Or it doesn't matter how you do it in the microarchitecture, right? So however you do it, that's an implementation choice. From the semantics that we're offering to the language and the compiler, you know, this is irrelevant. It will take longer or shorter, but we're, we're trying to convince the possible implementers of this ISA that you know, they have both the choice of going SIMD, if that's what they feel they should do, or the choice of going on the left is called temporal vectors, right? It takes multiple clocks to finish one vector instruction. And that's, you know, there are many reasons to pick one on the left, middle, or right, right? That was probably not meant for this audience, or maybe yes, but um, let's continue with the, um, the, the vector instruction set. So what do we have as instructions? So we have uh, fundamentally, you know, vector loads. Uh, vector load by by then sign half half and sign word I'm on the second line blah 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 and uh, float, floating point load half floating point load uh, 32 bit and 64 and then more interesting we have load strided and index load so you can have a um, if we're gonna load eight things from memory my max VL is eight and I do a vector load the obvious SIMD thing what AVX 512 does, and what SVE does, or basic SVE, you, it will load 512 bits contiguous from memory, right? And we'll bring them in. That's a, that's a vector load. But vector load strided says, no, I want to load 32-bit elements. So, you know, I'm going to load 32 bits from here. I'm going to stride by so many bytes, load 32 bits. I'm going to stride by the same bytes, load 32 bits, and go on. That's a strided load. What's an index load? That's a gather. Right? We should have called it gather, but the word gather didn't really fit there. So in a vector load index, what you provide is a vector of addresses, a little offset, and a base pointer. And you, every element of the vector of addresses is one address in memory. You load that and put it in your vector register. So you have the full set of instructions. No, the, the, uh, the address is contained in a vector register. So you are, and, 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 and it's, I called it offset because if your element maximum width is less than your address width, it really is an offset to a base pointer. So when we get there, it will be RS1 is your full XLAN pointer, so the full uh, architectural width of whatever your memory choice is, let's say 64 bit, there's a tiny offset uh, four bit just to allow compilers to you know offset from the same base pointer a little bit and then this vector is uh, maybe a 32 bit offset so you could have a four gig indirection over the base pointer if, if your max width is 64 bit then you have 
60 flow of plus 64, and you can go anywhere you want. Right? Uh, stores, same thing. And then um, the vector load one is just, uh, you know, what word you want to call it. At Intel, we call it broadcast. So that's you load one piece of memory, just one, 32 bits, and you splat it over the whole register, right? That can be convenient. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Both things work. You could do VLOAD1. So the question was, is that the approach to doing scalar in a vector? VLOAD1 certainly works. But you'll see in the encoding in a second that there's also a way to just generate something that, um, from a definition point of view, all elements of the vector have the same value. That's the definition we've chosen. The implementation, smart implementers will immediately recognize, because it's in the opcode, and they'll say, ah, I'll just do one and, and put it here on the side. Right? Something we've discussed in GCN talk last hour. Uh, is it well defined uh, if, if the same address is used in multiple lanes? Uh, what happens? Or yes, that the first one scatter is uh, from zero to n in that exact order. Okay. The second okay. one unordered is the implementation can do whatever it wants. So there's two opcodes to support that. Um, how does it end up with exactly one element? Say it again, sorry. Well, unordered always end up with uh, at least one element being exactly in place? Let's see, I'm parsing the question right. I mean, um, if all the addresses were the same in the vector, you wouldn't know which value would make it to memory at the end. But would at least one make it in the end? Or yes, could it yes, what, what, yes. At least one will make it, yes. Yes, guaranteed, yes. The only thing the hardware is not telling you is in which order it chose to do it. So, you know, if, if you somehow have conflict free addresses, then that's good, and probably the hardware can extract performance. But if you don't, you should use the other one. Otherwise, if you're doing a histogram update, you need the, the, the first one. OK. Um, how am I doing on time, Graham? OK, oh, really bad. OK, vector integer instructions, uh, the same set as you would find on the um, RIS-5 ISA. No surprise, add, add immediate, add uh, W is for 32 uh, bits add within a 64-bit world, sub mall div. The mall widening is interesting, takes uh, half, the, um, half the register plus one bit, multiplies, and produces a a, a double width register. Um, and the clips uh, are for fixed points, so that these are new relative to the base, but the rest are very, very standard. You put a V in front, and that's what it does. Um, let me move a little bit faster. Floating point, uh, standard set. It is a mandate of the vector spec that if you uh, implement the vector spec, you shall implement 16 bit floating point. There's no way out. That's if you want to be compliant, you've got to have 16, 32, and 64-bit uh, floating point. What's foremost for half-width? The IEEE. Um, there's some debate in the, in the working group. Like Some people would like not to do the, uh, the double precision. So, um, so maybe we end up splitting it like the base ISA, so S and D. And S would mandate half precision, right? But that would be the novelty with respect to the base ISO. So, so if you configure for, uh, if you configure uh, the loop for uh, max element 64 bits, then can you use the dot .s and dot .h as you well? Can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You'll get an exception if you configure for 16-bit and you try an S instruction uh, will will raise illegal illegal exception op, illegal opcode exception, right? Because there's no way you can do that. There are not enough bits to, to be done. Um, uh, multi FMA, no surprises here. There is an, obviously an FMA, and the widening FMA is really thought for all the machine learning guys out there wanting to do eight bits times eight bits which results in a 16-bit result plus a 32-bit uh, uh, pair, that's, that's, that's for them. 
Uh, what else? Converts, uh, won't bore you with the converts. Usual set, you know, there's a few that we can save because all the integer data types are sort of like widened to the maximum size, but you know, nothing, nothing to write home about. Um, and maybe these ones are a little bit more um, interesting. So you can insert uh, one scalar register from the normal RIS-5 ISA, an uh, X register or an F register at any position you want in the vector, right? Uh, that's the insert. You can do the reverse. You can take position seven of your vector and move it back to your scalar core and process it there. That's the extract. That's, that's non-constant non element, right? Non-constant, right? You see the uh, RS2 is a register, and that's, a, uh, that's, a, that's the index where you would put it or take it out. It's always indirect over a register. Always indirect. Uh, merge is, um, there are many ISAs that have these select instructions. So the vector mass tells you whether you pick the value from source one or source two. And that's just a, a, a I call it a multiplexer. Um, register gather would do uh, arbitrary permute. So it's a register to register movement of data. If you read the definition here, it says VS2 contains a vector of numbers. And you use those numbers to decide where things go, right? So you can get an um, arbitrary permute with that. Of course, <laughs> it's not going to be super fast. So don't, you know, the, the functionality is good. Go ahead. What happens if you have more registers and you can address the 64-bit? More registers. Well, the problem is the opposite. If RS2 is bigger than your max v, uh, your th than 32, or your max VL, depending on which one, it, the instruction does nothing. So, if you you have 32 elements, let's say, or 64 elements, and RS2 is 900, it's defined as a no-op. Okay, I mean, the other way around. If you have say 30 uh, 30 quintillion registers, and a 64-bit Address with. Ah, that's, well, you better make your X land big enough. <laughs> yeah. The spec doesn't force you. Let's see if we have a hole in the spec. Just for 42. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what I see, like, uh, for the compute, I think XACs allows you to, perm to have two source vectors and one. Mask thing, so you would need to do two of the vector registered gathers and then emerge in addition to That's do this yeah. one thing. You're right. right. You're right. Okay. You're right. I agree. Uh, the splat. I, I think. I think. Uh, I think we'll rename that to move. But splat just sets one uh, integer or floating point just to the whole register. And then slide down, slide up, or just um, if you want a a, um, um, a, re a reduced case, a, a simplified case of the gather, you could say we don't need those, but uh, those allow you to move your register down, and that's very useful for reductions. So we thought that by providing an opcode implementations could do something better than the arbitrary register gather, right? So by in the opcode saying I'm just moving the register down, maybe the implementation can do something clever. Or there are clever things that can be done. Um, and then vector mask operations. Um, sorry, yes, oh, uh, sorry. Can I, can I go, go back? Please? Absolutely. Uh, so do you, do you have butterfly exchange? So like the last two, but with the XOR uh, instead of the plus? No. Would you suggest it? It might be useful for reductions. Interesting. OK, I'll take it, yeah. That's a good suggestion. Uh, and then vector mask. The, uh, uh, basically, one thing I didn't explain is that um, there's no mask register. And I've been saying we have mask operations. So how does that work? What, what we've done is say v1, and that definitely affects GCC, is actually an implicit operation. Vector 1 is an implicit operand to all the instructions. So when we say something is done under mask, what it means is 
you, your instructions are, I want to add under mask V2 and V3. What you're going to do is you take the first element of V2 and V3, and you're going to look at V1, bit, uh, bit, the low order bit of V1, 0. Right? And you're going to say, if V1, 0 is true, I'm going to do the operation. If not, I'm not going to do it. Right? Show you, I think I have an example. So really, any vector, any of your 32 uh, vectors can hold, let's call it a, a, a bunch of booleans, right? And those booleans will, can be used uh, as a mask, right? So that's why we're not providing uh, operations between the mask, because if you have, you compute a bunch of booleans, because you have if A bigger than B, and then you have else something, you've computed a vector boolean, and you need to and two vector booleans, just do V and, right? No, that there's not, nothing special there. But then you'll have to move that, that mask into V1 to actually use it. So V1 will be a special register from the point of view of register allocation, um, and that might cause a little bit of trouble. But you guys have dealt with much worse things than that, so we assumed you, you would just get it done. Um, so then there's these operations really are helpers for going back to scalar code. So you can think like, um, is there, do me a pop count of the mask, and you, that can allow you to do early exit loops, right? If there's only three things set in my enormous mask, I don't want to do it in vector mode. I'm, I'm going to fall back in scalar mode. So for encoder, decoder people, that's useful. Um, you can find the, uh, the first bit set and, and things like that. Um, OK. Uh, How are we doing on time? You think we should so. give more time for questions, or you um, know, we can see if we can go super fast. So there's a really tr trivial loop, um, really, really trivial. Let's go fast. I think you guys will will just get that. So number number one step is initialize the vector unit. Um, we will have an instruction to configure the instruction. That's probably the most contentious instruction, and we haven't closed on a definition yet because we want to achieve so many things with just one instruction that we're not going to succeed. But fundamentally, the, the, the vector config instruction will say how many registers I want to use and what's the max size of any of the data types in this particular loop that I want to use. The intention here of that, um, uh, is that hardware will then use the available storage to give you very long vectors, right? So if you ask for only two registers and eight bit data types, and they have a kilobyte in there, hardware kilobyte. The idea is the hardware will reconfigure itself and give you really long vectors, right? So you can have you can you know have really long uh, operation, lots of performance, lots of energy savings, right? Um, maybe later another loop comes and you actually need six registers and now 32-bit data types, and the hardware you can reconfigure again. And our intention is that I'll get to you in a second. The um, Microarchitectures are fast in doing that. That there is not a, a expensive, really penal, you know, penalized operation, but that actually um, software in the compiler can really reconfigure at every loop nest um, to the best. That's the goal. If the implementers then do a really poor job, then <laughs> you're not going to be happy. But sorry. So, so it's the idea with that that the actual hardware with it that doing the large vector sizes will reduce the load on the front end in the implementation? Correct. Like, you need to decode less instructions? Correct. Like but, but then how does it, doesn't it also depend highly on an out of order implementation? Because otherwise you have uh, very, very many loads at the beginning and you're just stalled on the, on the load ports and you, you're not going to do any execution? Um, I love that question because that's an implementation one. And uh, yeah, but uh, but actually that is a good thing. I mean, if you uh, think that if you're going to be building this vector uh, microarchitecture, you'll want actually a deep address queue. And and it is really a platform question: Will you put a large L2? Will you put a? Will you bypass the L1 and go straight? I mean, there are many platforms you can build, and there are many things that many people that will do different things. In the old extremes, let's go back to 1972, some people would say, I'll have a scalar cache, and I'll go straight to my DRAM controllers, because, you know, wow, fantastic, I now have a stream of 128 requests, I spread them out to the controllers, and I get all these amazing bandwidth. Other people will say, no, no, come on, 
I'm going to put a 4 megabyte L2 or a 1 megabyte L2 or whatever it is. I'm going to put 4 cores. So it's going to depend really to your bandwidth, right? To your microarchitecture. So basically, for a compiler, the compiler should use the full vector risk that the hardware does, and the compiler expects the hardware to properly configure. That's the way, that's the mental way we're thinking. That, that it's yes. Very happy with right. Right. Now, <laughs> the hardware guys never, not, not always do the right thing. So, so, so you, we could tell you to use the maximum VL, and then, and then we botch it up. So that's possible too, right? Um, have you thought about the ABI for this? I'm just wondering what happens if you're running one of these loops, and then you get an interrupt, and you switch to a different thread, and it wants to configure the vector unit in a different way. Yes, Who's responsible the, for? you know, saving vector registers, saving So it's, it's not finalized by any means, and uh, the we're having a debate because, for example, it's, you, you're absolutely correct, and then when we get to gathers, what if a gather gets an interrupt in the middle, what's the state of the gather? So there's a little bit of opaque state, and we have not closed on how we're gonna uh, let the Linux type kernel get to that state. There's gonna be a, V opaque save or something like that that we have not closed, but we're, we're yes, that is needed, absolutely. But it's, it's not finalized. There's a little bit of thought about that sort of thing that's gone into the experimental work with LLVM that I'll talk about in a bit as well. Okay, moving on. Otherwise, we'll have no time for the um, LLVM. So you know, there's a vconfig instruction that would you know uh, definitely. Sorry, one thing I said. For sure, vconfig0 will disable the vector unit. So again, going for after power savings, the compiler can say vconfig0, and then you know the, the um, architecture will trap on any vector instruction. So you can do that and, and have some savings. So how is Reddish? Are the Reddish not preserved? Are the Reddish contents? No, no, they're not preserved. So vconfig resets all the state of, of the things. So th there's a very obvious and trivial hardware implementation to do vconfig fast and have a bit per register and say it's clean and, and move on and do it in one clock and not, obviously there's a bad implementation where you could would go through the thing writing zeros, right? But um, uh, Okay, so, you know, we've, we've configured our, our loop. The second thing you guys have to do from the compiler is use the VL register, so the vset VL instruction uh, is defined to return in the um, RD, right, the minimum of, um, of the max VL and your value. So if your max VL is 10 and you give me 3 million, I'm going to do mini minimum of 3 million and 10, right? I'm going to get it, uh, I'm going to work on 10 things and you'll have to loop around, right? That, that's the idea. And that also, if you want to discover the max VL of the instruction, you do a set VL with the max int and you get the actual hardware max VL um, intended, right? So um, we got, me? yes? Question specific about you, you just said you. You, I'm I, collecting. I, I know, so compiler. I want to understand, I mean, this, this is where I'm confused about this. So what you're saying is that the processor implementation can have a certain maximum number of elements. Yes. And I, as the compiler, can say, this is what I'd like to do a loop of, you said, 10 million. Right. And, gonna, and so now, at this point, I'm dynamically at runtime in the code I'm generating, inquiring of the processor of what, given the loop that I wanted to create. No, no. Uh, we're trying to avoid that. We're trying you to not inquire, and we're trying to not you have a prologue or a epilogue. The only thing you're going to do is you're going to set a register with your 10 million. You're going to set VL with this value. You'll do your loop, subtract the value you got back in RD, in our example 10, from your 10 million. So you, if you want to do 10 million, you'll subtract 10. So 9 million, blah, blah, blah. you'll jump back. And you'll now put the, this subtractive value there, and there's still a long way to finish. So you'll set VL will say again, yeah, man, I can only do 10. <laughs> so you'll go through the loop. So your loop will be one loop, no prologue, no AP look, uh, nothing. And it, it should just go whatever the hardware implementation is. So no dynamic, you don't need to check. You, you can check, but you don't need to. OK. Thanks. Uh, let's see if we finish the loop and I didn't convince you, then we more than happy to clarify. OK, so let's pretend that. So we would say, OK, I want to have in x1 1714, 
and I want to set VL in X2. So uh, VL will be set to the minimum between my max VL, let's use our example of 10, the minimum between 10 and 1714. So uh, both X2 is going to have a 10, and the internal vector length register is going to have a 10, right? In one instruction, we set two things. So now, um, let's go on. Vector load, so you know that's a unit stride. I'm not going to bore you, but uh, uh, floating uh, uh, um, 32 bits. Uh, that opcode is um, probably so. You know, x3 plus 8 is your base address. That's the uh, address, um, the base address, and then you increment the loop by size. In this case, size is four based on the opcode, right? So it just loads. This is the trivial CMD load. It loads contiguous 32-bit elements from memory. So that's what we would do to load that, um, that vector um, uh, vec, right, into the register v0. So we would write VF, VFLW, v0, blah, blah, blah. Now we want to load the, the scalar constant A. So for scalar support, as I explained before, you can say that a register holds a scalar. So let me go fast. And this would be the way you can set, create a scalar. That's a mnemonic. The assembly doesn't matter. But there's a bit in the encoding that says the destination is scalar. And notice how the definition changed. You just operate on element 0. And then you set the whole vector to the value you operated. So really, when you're saying, I want to do an add into scalar, v1, v2, you're doing something that's not as strictly a vector. You're taking the first element of v1 and v2, you're adding them, and boom, splatting the result into the destination. Right? That's how we, um, you know, if you are a dumb implementer, you'll actually do 10 times the addition. If you're a smart implementer, you'll do it one, and somehow you'll make a note in your microarchitecture that this register is scalar, and th that's how you'll use it in the future. Right? OK, so now. Uh, Let's see, we have the, um, you know, how we, um, I will skip that, just pick one in the interest of time. So we would do an FLD, right, at point 0.4. We would load from the address where the a a variable A is located into V2 as a scalar. And that actually changes. I could also have used a VFL1, and that would be slightly different. It's not exactly the same semantics, right, because this one, makes v2.s completely full, whereas VFL1 only fills up to max to VL. It's tiny difference in semantics, same thing. So now let's add the two damn things. Um, finally, we have v0, which we loaded from memory, a bunch of things, maybe 10 things. We have v1, where we have one scalar, and we do an add of a v0 and v1, and we put the result in v2. There's a question over there. So regarding to the scalar version, would you recommend a compiler to use all vector float registers as additional f scalar float registers for register allocation? Gosh. <laughs> That's my favorite topic. My fight with Christy all the time is that I would like <laughs> the opposite of what you just said. Let me, let me go back, because I don't know how to answer your question. So I'll answer something else. Um, uh, I would like a way to have uh, a scalar core with no floating point and just vectors. That's what I would like to have. And Christy, who's a very smart software guy, has convinced me, only partially, that the ABI, as it is frozen, there's no freaking way we can do that, because you guys need to pass parameters in the F registers. I needed to insert that into your answers. Nothing to do with your question. but. Trying to answer your question, by all means, why not? Because the hardware may be your dump one and so. Well, uh, that will be a, you know, sort of like a you know, low backend decision in the cost of the things, right? Or you can then the registry allocator, don't do it. Or maybe we need a way to be able to tell the registry allocator, don't do that. Don't use that. Right. But that's like really fine-grained cost model multi stuff. So. Okay, so let's store vector store. No surprises. The, we have a vector store. No, I hope that's and let's just show the whole loop and see if I clear your 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 concerns. So we would start with vconfig. The 63 is probably obsolete by now. So we would load 
outside the loop, the one constant, if we're smart enough to hoist it outside the loop. If not, that does a different problem. And we put in V1 as a scalar, so we have this A value across the whole loop. And now we start the loop and say, OK, set VL x1. x1 could have a million. And uh, the hardware is going to say, I'm sorry, I'm going to do only 10. So OK, you know, we're going to go around this thing with x2 having the number 10. We'll load 10 things from memory starting at pointer x3 into v0. We'll add v0 with our a constant. We'll then store the first 10 values into the resulting vector. And now we advance our pointers. So we need to advance the pointers x2. Uh, sorry, we need to advance x5. Uh, what am I doing here? Sorry, x3, which is the uh, pointer for the load, um, by the number of elements scaled by the size of the elements, so fine. And then I subtract from my counter x2, so I wanted to do a million thing, minus 10, 9 million, 900, uh, and then I branch back. And so this loop will get to any number, you know, power to, no power to, power your max VL, no power your max VL. This one loop should cover everything. Yes? Well, it was on a slide that unaligned loads may be slow. Correct. Um, but they must be supported. They must be supported. So how would you go about recommending what we now do, like prolog loops to align certain memory operations? How I, I could imagine like setting the first, setting a first different vector length yes. that matches somehow uh, this. Would you, you recommend doing this generally? Or would you say, well, Usually they will not be slow, but only a little bit. Or if he yeah, answers, by, then by, I don't by know unaligned, did you mean unaligned by the element or unaligned by the vector, which is I what I? Uh, totally. Uh, no, no, no. Unaligned must be supported. Period. But <laughs> but which, I would which build things you, unaligned? The I vector would, or the element? The the things I would build for you. <laughs> huh. Other people may do other things. Would be. Uh, fast on element alignment. That's the clever thing to do for an implementation. So if you're working on a VFLW, alignment to 32-bit is sufficient, not to 32 times 11 million 65. Right? That's, not, that's not a very clever implementation. Now, your question really is a, a cost model question. The prologue, is it going to be because an iCache miss worse? Is the iCache miss worse than? <laughs> than not peeling the thing exactly. If the vectors are long, this ISA is intended for people that actually like long vectors. Um, the hardware will probably be able to do that or will do it by itself. So it will immediately see your address, look at the three low order bids and say, oh, gee, man. <laughs> and will probably do the first two and then align itself naturally. Or at least that's how I would build a dcache that does that. because. If I have an address generator, I'll look at the first one and say, oh my man, one cache line. And then you know, maybe take the first two elements from the first cache line and then go by cache line. So it is completely possible to build such a thing in hardware. And I'm hoping the people will do that. And so you'll be happy. But of course, there's going to be a process that doesn't do it. And they'll need a different cost model. So no, 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 generate a prologue because um, it sucks on my architecture. OK, I, I've taken far more time than I wanted. Um, Stop here and uh, happy to, you know, back to you. Otherwise, um, so, uh, I, 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 I uh, at the beginning you mentioned register, uh, vector register contain matrix possible. I yes. Think but you didn't see yes, any it's, about it's not done yet. yet. We would like to add uh, the, with the type system the notion that a, a vector is a matrix and then have a, a FMA and an add and a mol mean what you would expect. that. I know that it's going to be weird that it's V5 and V7, but V5 will contain a matrix, V7 will contain a matrix, and you'll do a matrix add and a matrix multiply with one instruction. We would like to provide those opcodes where they make sense. But it's not specified yet. OK, I think what I'd like to do for the last few minutes um, is to um, report on what seems like the pra some pragmatic implementation choices that's come from experimental work done for LLVM and then ask the question, how would it hit you if similar things were proposed in GCC, or how would you respond? So I'll just have to flip over to my notes.
Uh, so this, this, this isn't some work that I've done with LLVM. This has been done by uh, Thomas Krupp of TU Darmstadt, who's uh, working in this area. So most of the work has been done um, by him um, in discussion with uh, LLVM developers on the LLVM dev, dev mailing list. Um, so initially he made a proposal to add a new IR type for this variable length vector because it seemed like that might be the easiest way to model the fact that the vector length might be changing frequently, uh, perhaps within fr from one loop to the next, the vector length frequently changing. Um, what looks like might be a, a simpler thing to do instead, um, instead of adding yet another new type uh, to generic LLVM IR is to reuse the same type um, that would be used for SVE vectors for ARM. Um, that does mean that um, that, that type um, has to deal with the fact that sometimes the register, uh, the size of registers might change when you when you reconfigure the vector unit occasionally, but not the um, active vector length. So that kind of forces a sort of ABI constraint on you that you would say that the vector um, the, the vector length remains constant within a function. Um, the maximum vector length remains within a function, remains constant within a function. Um, so, um, if you are going to call another function, you might save the vector, the, the vector configuration, um, and then the, the callee would reconfigure the vector unit as it suits. Um, that does imply a couple of things that might, that, that would seem like restrictions. The first is that you can't have vector arguments or return values because if, if, a, if a caller and a callee have got different um, ideas about what the uh, length of a vector is, that makes it problematic to pass a vector between them. Um, uh, yeah. To remember, the, the SVE was a variable vector size, not lengths, right? So, so you don't, you have different number of elements for the same vector size, but a different element size, right? It's, so it, it wasn't modeled like... It's not a VL. There's no active VL in, in SVE. Right, Correct. so yes. So Sorry, I, I'm yeah. probably munging to... Just, just How is that recording uh, register for the whole process? Yeah. Implementation time, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I'm probably being a little sloppy with my terminology interchanging uh, some things when perhaps I shouldn't. Um, Oh yeah, the, the other restriction that, that gives you is if, if you've got two independent loops within one function, you want to reconfigure the vector unit between them because that would be convenient. Um, it's just not possible to do that. Um, the, um, a, an implementation choice that um, uh, has also um, come up in the, in the LLVM implementation is that this, the vector length might be modeled not as being an integer length as such, but whether it um, is easier to implement uh, as a, um, say a, pr a predicate mask of a contiguous set of, of ones and zeros um, rather than using an integer. Um, so I'm not too familiar with that issue, maybe, but if I try to relay the discussion, the uh, mention around it, maybe it'll make a little bit of sense, or maybe not. The difficulty might be in uh, efficiently selecting an instruction depending on whether it's predicated or whether uh, the vector length is, um, depending on whether it's actually predicated or whether it's to do with uh, something about the vector length. Um, that's pretty much uh, a summary of the point, like a condensed summary of the points that I'm aware of from the LLVM experiments. Uh, I just want to open up now to any sort of comments or questions or feedback on, on those ideas. Um, the um, problem with keeping the vector length the same is not really um, uh, um, specific to function boundaries, but more to regions where vectors are uh, live at all. So uh, when you look at it this way, it becomes similar to shrink wrapping. If you can identify two separate loops and there's no, there are no vectors live, um, before and after, then you could uh, have separate uh, configurations. You could do. Um, I think that perhaps the issue specifically in LLVM is that there's this existing uh, type for, or, for, or if, if you want to share 
uh, the same type for an SVU vector as for a, um, a risk V vector, then you don't have the freedom to make those reconfigurations because in SVE it's not reconfigurable like that. It sounds to me like the largest problem you have with changing the vector length within a function is that um, you can't you can't guess what um, you need to if you need to spill these vector registers at all, then you need to somehow compute the amount of stack space you'll need. Um, with SVE, that's that's easy because the, the vector length needs a kernel uh, help to change. Whereas here, if you're changing it, you know every third instruction, then you know you you can't have pre-computed stack space in which to store it. Um, whereas, well, why would you not use just the max all the time? I mean, set VL. But so, the, yeah, a uh, very naive <laughs> hardware guy. Function begins, you can do a set VL with the max in value just to figure out but before you, just, you, you allocate you your said, stack. You just said that uh, vconfig, like if you, if you want, you know, four registers in You're right. A and You're right. eight registers You're right. in. You're right. Yes, take it yeah. back. Yes. Yeah. Oh. You said that I don't need to care that uh, my actual hardware register isn't as long as the array that was written in the code. But I, it seems like I do need to care because if, if, the, if the register in hardware is large enough, then when I'm setting a vector, I expect at the end of it, I have a register with the value that I need. But if I'm setting a thousand sized array and the loop is just overwriting the same small array, then there has to be actually a write to memory because that thousand size array is no more in a register and you just overall the register like a few times in loop. So there should be like a spill, like a write at the, in that loop with the code. There should be a write to memory that I didn't see. Well, we did, we did have a store. Should, de should no, depend we... on whether the configure t tells me that it's too, it's too large and I can't do it. I, I, I agree mean? with you, the, the, the loop did have a store. And, and, and you have to Maybe store. Maybe just went by too fast. Yes, uh, my apologies. But he, he, I think you're right that uh, the stack space goes with config. I, I would agree, right? Because if, if you, 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 there's a loop and you decide you need five spill variables, and, and, but if you've just configured, the, the, the amount of space you might need is related to the, um, to the stack space. You could always take the approach of, okay, I'm going to make my stack space as large as the worst case, it's 32 registers, max VL, no surprises, right? The storage that I need is known to be bounded by this value. So you could always start the function by just taking the max. Right. Yeah. David. Might not be ideal, might not be ideal. If you can query the max easily. That's true, yeah, that's just had VL. You, you know the register is 32, and the max VL, you can multiply these two numbers, you know the max storage that this implementation has. That's a known, that's a trivial to know. Now, it might not be ideal, and, and you guys, I'm sure <laughs> you're making the stack a, just as large as needed, right? And not, oh, boom. Right. We do this as so, so so that it does will be so you you probably you probably need to to have a like slightly more complex iteration than just using the max of the number of iterations because of dependence issues. Sometimes you have a maximum dependence you have to honor, so you probably have to have two loop counters that are kind of dependent okay. on each other. So it's probably the that's the ideal way when when you know you have no dependencies at all. But if there's like a maximum dependence distance, like with the, the OpenMP Zimplen thing, you have an additional constraint on the, on the maximum vector lengths that may be then lower in the implementation or for the remaining number of iterations, 
So the iter actual iteration scheme may look a li little bit more complicated. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, we've run into tea time. Uh, oh, we fantastic. can carry the conversation on over a cup of tea. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. You.